So hello and welcome, happy Friday. Today is Friday, December the 8th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 234. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I'm really glad that you're here. We have a lot to get through today. And uh, what's going on outside? I know you want to know. Fickle weather, that's what's going on. 51 degrees Fahrenheit, that means the bees are flying right now. They're doing cleansing flights and getting water and doing all the things they need to do. Very unusual considering we have snow coming plus a bunch of rain. A lot of the United States is being hit with rain. 4.7 mile per hour winds. By the way, 51 Fahrenheit is 11 Celsius, if you want to know. 61% relative humidity. So, not bad, not bad at all. Can't go out and do anything special with your bees, but it's a good start. So, oh, the first thing I want to go over before I get started, I have to eat crow. So, this bag that I talked about, and if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, go ahead and look down in the video description below. You'll also see a link that you can follow to turn in your own topic for consideration. I had this uh, idea that I talked about last Friday, lining this with a plastic bag. Well, that was premature, and that'll teach me not to share about an idea before completely vetting it. I knew it didn't work well to put honey in this to feed back to your bees and use this bag to keep there from being an expansion chamber in the top. But even with the tiniest diameter drill used to make holes in that cap, after I left it there for a little while inverted, I came back and it was slowly seeping. This does not work. You're better off going right back to just the containers with your honey in it if that's what you're going to feed back to your bees for now because they don't have another alternative other than what's already been out there as far as feeders go. So backtrack on that. Don't listen to me when it comes to that one. That's one of the problems with looking at something for a short amount of time and assuming that it's working and then you come back later and say, oh, it didn't work. I had to change my whole thumbnail and everything. I thought I was onto something worthwhile. So the topics we're talking about today were submitted during the past week, and there's a lot going on. So um, people like to send stuff to me, and sometimes it's about another YouTube channel, and I don't like to comment directly on other YouTube channels. Unless, of course, it's favorable, I don't like to criticize other channels. So it seems like whenever a new idea, or what seems to be a new idea, or a new take on something that people have been doing, there's a certain group of viewers that really love to jump on and say, see, they were wrong all along, I knew it. And then people get all dramatic about uh, how they can't trust anybody and things like that. But what I want you to do is carefully look at and listen to everything. Don't just look at the beginning of a video or the primary message of a video and think that you understand everything that they're going to cover because they're fairly involved. This particular one, uh, came out and this is from Ed in Winona. I want to say it's Minnesota. Okay. So it says, what do you think about Umberto's latest video doubting the effectiveness of oxalic acid vapor to control Varroa mites? Okay. So what we're talking about is Umberto, Dr. Umberto Boncristiani, and uh, his channel is Inside the Hive. And so what I wish... I already know what I think about it, but anyway, Ed, if you watch it, when you see the oxalic acid vaporization going into the different hives, by the way, that's my hand. That's my vaporizer. So yes, I know about the video. But it's an example of jumping to conclusions, right? So we talk about varroa destructor mites, which hopefully by this time of year, um, if you're in the northeastern United States, you've hit your kind of low brood period and you've given a treatment if it was warranted based on the numbers. So what I want to do is clear up a little bit about that particular video um, for Inside the Hive TV. If you don't already know, you could check that out. But uh, people get upset to find out when there are excerpts from that where it says uh, that maybe it was ineffective or less effective, oxalic acid vaporization. And the people like to write in there and say, yep, I use 10 grams because that one gram dose doesn't work or the recommended or approved method doesn't work. So I blow it in there with a, um, 
you know, I don't want to say a flamethrower, but people are willing to do anything that someone seems to say will work and they try it out. But there is a very careful procedure established for proving a lot of things for any treatment. And so the things that are in the video are true, of course. And when I say that, it's because uh, some people get upset. Well, it didn't have any impact on the Varroa. They were the same before and after treatment on these hives in some cases. So I believe there were three test groups there. The thing is, um, if the numbers of the mites were the same pre and post treatment, that means the mites were not reproducing and expanding. And then you might say, and rightfully so, that doesn't that mean that oxalic acid was not very effective? Well, it depends on your goal and what your infestation level was before. So then some people say, well, I saw somebody use a fogger. And when they used a fogger, they said 100% mite control, no matter what, through the cappings and everything else. And early on, uh, when oxalic acid was just being approved, there were people that said that if you give it a certain amount or a certain delivery method, that it took out all the mites in the hive, even those under the pupa cappings. And that is not what's been proven with oxalic acid. That's why I want to caution you a little bit about, you know, shifting with the wind on what your treatments are, what the effectiveness is going to be, because it is not the same effectiveness. You'll often hear this word interchange with efficacy. So effectiveness, efficacy, same thing, right? Um, so when you have brood present, this is why they have a series of treatments in a row because with brood present, with capped brood specifically, the varroa destructor mites that are underneath these cappings are not going to get the oxalic acid on them, and therefore they're not gonna be impacted or killed by the oxalic acid treatment. And this is why I've tried to say this, but maybe I'm just not being clear about it, but your best times for oxalic acid vaporization effectiveness are when there's low or no brood present. The reason for that is we need the mites to be exposed. We used to say um, that they were phoretic mites, that they're exposed and unprotected, but now we say that they're in their dispersal phase. I know that doesn't mean anything to you, but the point I'm making is uh, the varroa destructor mites have to be open to the air where the oxalic acid is vaporized and roaming around like a mist that lands on everything because we need those varroa destructor mites to be in direct contact with the oxalic acid mist. And you've done that with sublimation, right? So when we've even been through, uh, but as far as application, I should probably address this. Um, this is kind of the wild west. It seems with a lot of beekeepers that just want to treat any old way they want with any delivery method, partnering it with mineral oil, alcohol, anything else that they can think of as a delivery vehicle. And that's why the fogger was not part of the approval process. So the fogger had issues. So I, I wish people would lick into question and challenge every delivery method they hear about, because you'll find out when they got approval to use oxalic acid, they had to prove that it would treat the varroa destructor mites and that the impact on the bees themselves or the larvae, the developing bees, that that would be minimal right? It's all part of getting something approved. So the delivery approved methods are sublimation. So that's with the vaporizer, with the vaporizing pans that are the most basic example of that. There's the dribble and there's the spray method. So people spray sugar syrup with oxalic acid in it. The dribble is also a way of dribbling oxalic acid in a thick sugar syrup that delivers it to the bees. The bees consume it, gets on the bees. So, uh, and then of course, the most effective of those three uh, delivery approved methods is vaporization. And so the advantage of that is, you know, one of the big advantages with delivering it through vaporization. And, and a lot of people I understand are frustrated because some of the new delivery systems are expensive. Let's be honest. If you have an instant vape, which I do have, and I had the pro vape before that, that was expensive too. So I have wasted a lot of money, my own money. Those things were not given to me. So um, it's a big, you know, I'm just bleeding money out of these things. And the thing is, 
I want the best treatment for the mites so that I can turn around and explain to you what's working and when does it work? How does it work? Why does it work? When's the best time to use it? Okay. So it's not as straightforward as you think. So for example, if they were doing treatments and one of the three test groups showed no improvement, in other words, no reduction of the numbers of varroa destructor mites. So on the face of that, you would say, well, then it doesn't work. But if, uh, if I were to tell you that during that treatment period, untreated, then the varroa mites would have doubled with every brood cycle that went through there, let's say. So then instead of, you know, 100 mites, you would have had 300, but now we still have 100. Now, does that mean we got the mites under control? That depends on what your level of control uh, needs to be so that your bees can survive. I think we're, I hate to say it, but we're waving the white flag a little bit on getting rid of mites completely. So again, it's not just your oxalic acid vaporization treatment, and there are a lot of other treatments available. And I know if you're a new beekeeper, this is very confusing. So I have to say that before oxalic acid was approved in the United States as a treatment for the bees, and we were behind the curve on that. It was already approved in other countries around the world that were having very good success with it. So part of, you know, the discussion here should be, well, if it doesn't work at all, why are these other countries so heavily behind this organic treatment, a naturally existing material that does not harm the bees, but has proven effective in treating varroa destructor mites. So I'll move on with that. I was treatment free up until that point. And the reason was I didn't want to get into Kumafos. I didn't want to get into all these other treatments that were showing that they were building residue in the hive, in the comb and everything else. So my initial beginning with beekeeping involved treatment free management of bees. And that means genetics was going to be the key. And I got all excited about that. I want it to be treatment free. I don't blame you if you want to be treatment free even today, but it's very active management of beehives. It's a lot more involved than you think. The days of setting up a beehive and checking your bees twice a year are pretty much gone if you want to understand when things can go bad and how quickly that can spread through your apiary. So I was treatment free for over 10 years. And uh, when oxalic acid got approved, I started right off with the little sublimation wands that you put your ounce of uh, oxalic acid in, you put it in the entrance. And that's why I started using uh, slatted racks, for example, underneath of my deep brood boxes. That's because the slatted rack on my brood box up off the landing board, I had a two inch spacer there and now could accommodate my oxalic acid vaporization panel or a little wand. And so once I did that, I kept the, um, slatted racks as spacers. So uh, when they came out with the ProVap and the Instant Vap, so the Instant Vape I've only had for a year. The ProVap I've had for a couple of years before that. That allowed me then to drill a quarter inch hole in the back of the hive through that uh, slatted rack and then I could deliver my oxalic acid from the back, close up the front and do a treatment. Now the key to effective treatment, the highest efficacy, and this is why um, a lot of the lab experts, a lot of entomologists, a lot of people with a lot more letters behind their names than I will ever have, uh, say that the most effective time to treat with oxalic acid is during low or no brood periods. So this time of year, right now. Today, for example, it's in the 50s. My wife told me it was going to hit 60. I'm sure she got that from the weather guy. So we know that's going to happen for sure because the weather guy said it. But uh, if it's warm enough and they break cluster, they open up and they're doing flights and things like that. And we're at a low brood period, which we are. We can tell that through thermals, by the way. And you would just guesstimate that based on what other people tell you. If you have access to an observation hive and things like that, you can learn a lot and kind of assign what's going on in these few sample hives to the rest of your apiary and at least get better efficacy of your treatment, right? So at this point, a single treatment can and has produced 96%. This is the top end. So 90 to 96% efficacy in reducing existing varroa destructor mites in your hives. And it's important now, 
even though you needed to do this also back in August, for example, if you had colonies that were showing high mite levels, treatment is necessary back then because your bees start to share resources, they drift to other colonies, and they can be dispersing the mites in their dispersal phase into a bunch of other hives, even on the bodies of drones and things like that. So when there's a lot of capped brood, we have a lot of protected mites. That's what I want to get across. When we have uncapped brood, low or no brood, then we have a higher efficacy with oxalic acid vaporization. So um, there are people that I have high respect for that will use uh, low brood periods. They'll use the oxalic acid, and then they go to something like mite away quick strips. And I had on the shelf Formic Pro in packets. So I bought two big boxes of that stuff, never used a single one because none of my hives hit the threshold. If I lie to you, the viewer, about what's working and what isn't, I'm also risking your bees and my credibility would go in the toilet really fast. So I'm doing my best to explain to you that integrated pest management is a big part that using bees that are healthy and acclimated to your environment is another big part of their success in surviving the presence of Varroa. So when we get a chance to knock Varroa down, we do it. When we get a chance to make our bees stronger, we do it. If we have a screen bottom board with a tray that removes underneath of that, uh, we have a chance to passively get rid of what's reported to be up to 15% of the Varroa destructor mites that are present in the colony when they're out and about on the bodies of the bees because the bees also kind of passively groom them off, right? And uh, But varroa mites will just fall off the bee, hit a solid bottom board, crawl right back up, get on another bee, and they're back in business, right? So by having a screened bottom board with a removable tray, and that tray you can spray with Pam or whatever you want. And uh, so when they get groomed off and they fall into these, uh, through the screens into that tray, they're stuck down there. And then you can pull that and see, you know, kind of what kind of mite load you've got. It's not a meaningful way to actually give an assessment. You can't say, you know, you look at 30 mites there or something like that and make an assignment to what you would have gotten from a sampling of 300 bees, which is a pretty standard sample size. But what you can see as time passes specific colonies that have more mites in the tray than other colonies do. And then those become the colonies that you focus on, that you do mite counts on, and that ultimately may meet a treatment threshold. So I've gotten my mites under control with oxalic acid vaporization and integrated pest management only. Now I'm ready to go the next level. So the next thing that comes up is people will say with a lot of confidence, if you only treat with oxalic acid, then those mites will have a resistance ultimately to oxalic acid and they will survive and now you've got a resistant colony. So it's very important to cycle through a variety of different treatments. However, in my own defense, if I get my mites under control through integrated pest management, genetics of my bees, and oxalic acid vaporization, and if my numbers are down, then why do we need another treatment method trying to zero them out? Zeroing out your mites may not be possible. So I'm going to throw another monkey wrench in there. So this is where people are misinterpreting that video. At least I think they are. If you can do, this is where the series of treatments comes into play, right? because we know how long the bees are spending under a pupa cap. So we know how much opportunity the phoretic mites have to scoot under those and become protected, right? That's where you get the cycle. The original cycle was three treatments, seven days apart. That kind of makes sense. That's 21 days. People were not seeing enough of a reduction in the varroa mite numbers in their hives doing that. So down the line, and today when you do your research, you find out that they've, it's kind of magically disappeared. How many treatments you should give and at what intervals. So the next interval that came up that I liked, if you had a really strong colony, would be um, every five days. And then you have to count your mites, a mite drop, do a mite wash, which a lot of people do not want to do at all. 
it's physically demanding. They have to pull honey supers. They have to get into their bees. They have to get into the nurse bee area and the brood area, and they have to count mites on bees, which means killing the nurse bees, which are the nicest bees in your colony, the most valuable bees. And some people don't like to do that. That's why they fall back on trays, sticky boards, and counting methods like that, which are less accurate, but they do indicate the presence of mites. So when you do these treatments, you do a mite drop count 72 hours after the treatment. You have to give it time. You can't you can, but you shouldn't check like right away and say, oh, they're not dying. It takes a while. They're, it's not fully understood how oxalic acid enters the varroa destructor mite and kills it. So there were discussions about it getting on the little pads of their feet and that these pads, of course, um, through osmosis can draw whatever they're in contact with into their body and kill them. So part of that you know, mode of action on these varroa destructor mites was that their little feet would be in contact with the oxalic acid, they have a low tolerance for it, and then they die. They've also shown that they can lose their ability to hold on. So they're not like a tick. The varroa destructor mite doesn't hold on with its mouth parts, and I'm sure at some point in your life you've pulled a tick off of something. And even though its little feet are just all sticking up in the air, you pull it and uh, its head really holds on, and you don't want to leave parts of its head in the body of your cat, your dog, whatever it happens to be. So, but a varroa destructor mite does not hold on very well with its mouth. It's feeding there, but it's holding on with its feet. So if its ability to hold on with its feet is removed, it falls off easy, which means it's easily groomed. The other part of that is, for me personally, my control is I have bees that are heavy groomers. So they actively comb over every inch of the body and they will get a hold of and work on a varroa destructor mite until it's removed from the body of that worker. And unless they do further damage to it, that mite just topples down. Hopefully there's a screen on your bottom board. Right now at about 50% screen, not screen. I have solid bottom board still. And so I do have some screen and not screen because I'm following my practice of incremental changes in hive configurations to ultimately see a consistent trend of one being better than the other, okay? And it's not just for varroa mite catching, it's uh, overall hive production, longevity, reproduction, population, everything else. So anyway, if you can get your mites off, the other thing is you can, uh, for those, especially with backyard beekeepers who don't want a colony to grow super strong, super sized, right? We over just the past year, have been playing around with isolating the queen on a single or two frames of uh, brood. The reason we can do that is now we have the frame with the queen confined on it. We have nurse bees on that frame. She's laying her eggs there. And if we transfer the queen onto a frame that has nothing but drawn comb and the nurse bees can come and go because it's like a queen excluder. Once the queen starts to lay eggs there, we have a starting point. So then we look at eight days after that, um, that we can pull the queen away from your hive into a nucleus hive, right? We can treat her with oxalic acid because they're not capped yet. That's key. They're not capped any of the varroa destructor mites we took with her based on scientific study, observation, and verification. We know we're going to get 96 out of 100 of those mites on a good day, right? So we transferred her, we've got her set aside in another hive. Now we wait on the hive that we pulled her out of. So we push those frames all together and we put a spacer frame at the end because we're ultimately gonna bring her back. And then when we're past the day when she laid that last, remember she's been laying in those frames for eight days, right? So for that period of time, we're looking at when all of these frames that are left in that hive are now Emerge. So there are no capped broods. So we're also, those that would be capped the longest would be your drones. So you want to pay attention to that. Maybe it's a good time to uncap your drones and do some control there too. At the same time, now we have a completely exposed colony of bees that uh, we can treat with oxalic acid vaporization. We get the mite drop that we need. Now we bring our queen back and we plug her back in. So we've nailed the mites, we slowed production, and we have uh, slowed down brood. And this is why I bring this up for backyard beekeepers that don't want to expand their apiary. You kill several birds with just one stone here 
in that we've created a broodless period. We treat it with oxalic acid vaporization, which does work on exposed mites, mites in their dispersal phase. And then we've greatly reduced those. Now, would we do that with just one colony? No, I think we should do it if you're a backyard beekeeper with all of your highly populated colonies or those with the highest mite counts if you want to play that game and only target those that are having the most difficulty. So there are a lot of ways to deal with it, but uh, does OA only slow down Varroa was the question. Yes, it can hold the Varroa numbers exactly the same if you waited to do this during a spring buildup and you did not do any of the things I just described, which would include possibly isolating the queen in a queen isolation cage. So you know what they look like. This is a two frame version, right? You could do that. It wouldn't matter if it's one or two frames because this is all drawn comb. When you put your queen in here, that's when she starts laying eggs. That's when your calendar gets marked. Eight days after putting this queen in here, you're taking her somewhere else, you're separating her and you're giving them a treatment and you're preventing Varroa mites from going off other bees and getting in here. So we have an isolated treatment group and now we're waiting until the main brood box also is not capped. I know I've said it, but I'm just gonna say it again. Then you have nothing but exposed mites in that hive and you can treat them. So, backyard beekeepers can control their populations, reduce swarming because population increase is part of your swarm trigger. And that all plays together. So what else did I want to talk about? I think that's about it. So question number two, that was question number one. Now we go to, this is a YouTube channel name, Francine Keen. And it says, hi Fred, did you insulate all of your flow hives like this? Or do you recommend the B-Smart insulated inner cover? Okay, so when we're talking about insulating things, I've shown this many times over, so I'm sorry if this is redundant for you. The B-Smart insulated inner cover is this thing right here. Now, I did not put that on my flow hives, for example. So instead, I've gone double bubble crazy. So I put that on top of my inner cover. I put that on the inner side walls of my feeder shim, which is nothing more than a medium box. In the case of the flow hives, I have a two inch shim on top there that's made from a flow hive. And uh, it's all lined with double bubble and the gabled roof there is also lined with a double bubble. So I did do that with all of my flow hives this year. So they do not have the B-Smart insulated inner cover. Now the other part of that is that thing came out at a time when I had just started using, you know, within two years of its coming out, I was using my feeder shims, which had an integrated inner cover built into the box. So the feeder shim, but I didn't, I wasn't using double bubble yet. So I was using other insulation there and using the space and I had insulated outer covers where today, if I were just feed, building my feeder shim, um, I would just have the double bubble right on top of the interior surface of that. And I would double bubble the side walls and I would still put a, layer of double bubble over the top of it. And I know I'm gonna say double bubble a lot of times. And then I would have my uh, insulated outer cover over the top of that. So you don't have to have the B-Smart inner cover. It just takes the place of what I was doing before. Um, the B-Smart inner cover has features that my feeder shim, which was wooden, which had a level inner cover on it. The B-Smart one is a little bit domed. So if condensation hits that interior surface, it would trickle off to the side walls and then down. The good news is that uh, we're not getting a lot of water on the inner cover once it's insulated. So that dome aspect may not be so required after all. And if you want to see the feeder shim, I'll put a link down in the video description so you can see how to build your own. You can see how it's made and you can kind of see what I did with it. The other thing was that it was, um, Originally, because people are talking about quilt boxes and things like that, uh, for insulating the inner cover area, the top of your hive, if you insulate anything, we'll say it over and over, insulate your hive cover first, insulate the outer walls of your hive if you want to, but always start with the cover of your hive. And oftentimes uh, people will give presentations about quilt boxes 
for example, and if you look at my feeder shim, it looks a lot like a quilt box. It just doesn't have the quilt in it because it was used to house a wrap it around feeder or anything else you wanted to feed up there. So I've even made changes to that now because now I'm using fondant. The wrap it around gets pulled. So now I have the fondant pack laying on there. So, which actually made it much easier. And then I can just put layers of double bubble over the top of my fondant pack. And I just have, you know, more insulation, more R value up above uh, the bees in the hive there. So one of the early things I did was people were like, you know, you need to vent that. You need to, your bees are going to want ventilation up there. So you know what? I took a couple of those. So I even showed those modifications too. I drilled inch and a half diameter holes. I put number eight screen in them and uh, I allowed ventilation to go through there and up through the top. But if you do that early enough in the year to where the bees have control over that interior surface, they sealed up 100% of the exposed screen up on my feeder cover, my feeder shim. So the bees communicated that way over and over. Now here's the thing, you can do this where you live, find out. Maybe your bees do want some ventilation through the top. I can't say they don't. I'm just saying I followed the lead of my own bees when they consistently seal up anything but their main entrance. So since they sealed them back up, I said, well, there you go. They've spoken. They do not want air movement through the top. So I want to take you back a little bit because quilt boxes are something. And I've seen people do very elaborate quilt boxes. So what I want to invite you to do is there are a lot of ways to do research, by the way. For example, you could say Google search, Fred Dunn sucks, I can't stand him. And then you're going to find, you know, probably a whole group of people that agree with you. Or you could just say Fred Dunn's the best, I think he's awesome, which is probably the more true of the two searches, right? And then you find out, yeah, there's a whole group that says he's above average. But if you just type in, what about Frederick Dunn? then you see you kind of get an even thing about it. So, and this is what people tend to do. Quilt boxes are the best or the best quilt box rather than searching quilt box. What is it? For example, quilt box, the beginnings of the quilt box, who designed it? When did it come about? What's going on? Because it was very interesting. I was listening to another presenter at a bee conference. And he said, quilt boxes, when they first came out, uh, came out at a time when you didn't have, you didn't have bubble, double, double bubble. You didn't have polystyrene. You didn't have insulation that we have today, modern insulation. They created a box, an enclosed box, and they filled it with, uh, quilt box originally had straw, hay, and wood shavings in it. In uh, Rome, as far back as 27 BC, they used uh, straw insulation and uh, a Roman writer named Varro, V-A-R-R-O, did a whole thing about insulating your beehives back then. But the quilt box originally came up as a form of insulation. It didn't have any vent holes in it and stuff. It wasn't designed for air to even pass through it. It was a way to take advantage of what they knew could provide insulation to beehives all the way back before Christ, which now... They changed on us. Now it says BCE, which is B for current era. And then we have CE, current era. I don't even know when they made that change because for me it was always Anna Domini, uh, the year of our Lord. And before it was before Christ, BC. And it's changed and I don't remember any discussion about that. It just started showing up everywhere. So BCE is the same as what used to be BC. And... Uh, you have it AD instead of after death or the year of our Lord. You have now the current era. So anyway, way back then in China and Egypt were doing it too. They built boxes. They put them on top of the hives and they enclosed their hives with leaves, grass, and animal dung. Today we have better stuff than that. So the idea of venting it off came around much later. So even Langstroth mentioned the quilt box in 1853 and the quilt box that he built was not vented. So it had to do with making use of what we know. I'm surprised somebody didn't list like duck feathers or something, duck down. You would think that would be very insulating. So the quilt box was an early insulation layer, which now we've moved all the way up to this providing more insulation than the old material did. This is an R10 
with a plastic shield around it so that your bees don't eat it, hopefully. But so we've come through a lot of changes on that. So for the for so now I'm just any way that you're going to close air, trap air, keep air from moving, you create a greater R value cover. And then down the sides you go with more insulation as needed. If your bees aren't making it very well, time to ramp up your insulation. And again, I recommend incremental increases in insulation. You are not going to match what a tree is made like. And when you look at uh, tree cavities and you're looking at feral colonies of bees, sometimes the cavity walls are actually very thin. They're not as thick as a lot of people say things like, well, they're used to having six inch thick walls and things like that. But uh, in a lot of bee trees, they're not consistently the same. I'm sure they've developed averages. And I'm sure Dr. Seeley went around when he was measuring the cavity size, the volume, the space that bees are choosing. They were also doing tests on the walls of the wood, for example. So what I'm finding out in my own bee yard with all the different hive designs that I'm using, insulated hives are doing really well. Um, when you add insulation to your hive, you add material to compose that hive. So if you're adding you know, there's a lot of pushback on polystyrene. It's over 90% air, right? So, but the rest is plastic. So everything that we put on our hives, you know, here I am showing you double bubble. This is aluminized, but the inside is a plastic material. So the Be Smart Designs thing is plastic with polystyrene insert. Uh, the outer covers. So my feeder shim, it, it kind of, I could see it looking good to somebody who wants to avoid plastics. I could see it looking good to find a way to bag and create a quilt box again. Go right back to 1853, but don't vent it. Create a solid box, make it as thick as you need it to be, and use your quilt in there and put your feet underneath that. I don't see why that wouldn't work. The only part that I'm personally recognizing through the years that was not a very good move was when people started to add venting, thinking that your bees needed to vent off. And there are many reasons why you do not want to do that. Likewise, there are many reasons why you want the cover, inner cover of your hive to be warmer than the sidewalls. You want the dew point to occur there. We've talked about it many times. I think it's worth talking about again because somebody might be listening to this for the first time. And I want you to really think about where condensation is going to form inside your hive and what the history of the quilt box really is. People just get ideas, assign human comfort levels to it, wow, it's really humid inside this hive. We need to do something about that humidity. Well, we find out that we can get rid of some of that humidity if we vent it off. And then somebody else comes along and studies the Varroa destructor mite, which has been around not as long as the quilt box. And we find out that with high CO2 levels and higher humidity levels, in the absence of a vent, the Varroa destructor mite can have its reproduction in winter reduced to 1%. Now, that's not across the board with a lot of studies. These are lab environment studies, right? So that's the other part of things. When we assign theory to insulation value, the cluster movement, the consumption of energy, conduction, convection, insulation, dew points, and things like that, we can assign a bunch of engineering principles to that. But the honeybee is a living organism and the honeybee is dynamic. So what the honeybee is doing must be observed in the way that it's going to be kept. In other words, out in the environment, in the hive that you're going to keep it in, and you need to collect these parameters of uncontrolled environments, right? So then you find out what is your backyard beekeeper ability to figure out whether or not your bees are making it the way you're configuring their hive and uh, the way you're feeding your bees, the number of boxes you're putting on, how much honey you're keeping for them, uh, your direct observations year after year, and how keen you are at identifying and documenting what your bees are demonstrating they prefer. That's going to help you arrive at eventually a very consistent success rate with your bees all year round. Because once you master what your bees do, what they prefer, how they manage the spaces you provide them with, you will find that your success rate increases consistently um, through the years, season after season, if you don't, like most do, quit at your third or fourth winter of beekeeping. 
stick around, be keen about what works. And just because somebody said something works over here, something works over here, if you're constantly shifting and making 100% change to your entire apiary every time you think something new and better and improved is, is going on, you probably will have a difficult time arriving at your own best beekeeping practices, right? So the other part of that is, is having your own stock of bees. Number one, you're removing your dependency on any other beekeeper, any other supplier. So if you find that you've got good bees that are consistently performing well, that have the disposition that you want, and they do the things that you want from your bees. For me, they just do bee stuff because I want to learn about them. But I realize now this is my 18th winter of cycling back my own bees. And that when I did bring in another bee, last year I introduced two new bees, right? Two new queens that were carniolans. Prior to that, the only time I brought in new queens were the bee weaver queens from Nova Soda, Texas. And uh, because of their ability to survive untreated. And even when the state inspector came through and wanted to know what I was using to treat for varroa mites at the time, I was not treating with anything and he was hard pressed to find any varroa mites. Now, that did not hold up. Ultimately, I did get varroa mites, their numbers did eventually climb, and I did resort to treatment. So, but what I do have is now a core group of bees that are very hardy, and I have to be cutting back on them. I have too many colonies of bees, and now I can pick my top performers, work exclusively with those. So, all of that from a question about whether or not I insulate all of my flow hives this way. I do insulate them that way. So the Be Smart Design uh, insulated inner covers are not on my flow hives anymore. Uh, I do use them on my standard Langstroth hives, however, and they're very good. Question number three comes from Daryl Hammer, 4608. That's a YouTube name. This may sound like a beginner question, but I've often wondered, once you get the hive past the swarm impulse without a swarm in a high population colony, has brought in a high volume of nectar, what then? You have a large population of bees likely facing some degree of dearth. I guess a split would be the best answer, but what if you have all the hives you want? Any thoughts would be welcomed. Okay, so the spring buildup generally brings swarms, right? A lot of beekeepers want to keep that under control. So the other thing is we want to keep our numbers down. One of the things I was, when I interviewed Cayman Reynolds, you can look at the interview. I have a page, thewaytobe.org, and the page is marked interviews. You can watch something like that. Uh, so if you look at the Cayman Reynolds one, we talked about different treatments. One of the things was uh, how Formic Pro takes out a bunch of your bees. In other words, uh, one of the things I would recommend, right? So you're a backyard beekeeper, you've got bees doing really well, the, the numbers are growing, and you're trying to avoid having to make a split. And you do an inspection and you find out, guess what? They're not making any queen cells yet. Bonus, you found your queen. Bonus number two, pull the queen in her frame, and I recommend those queen isolation cages. Where can you get them? You can get them from betterbee.com. Tell them Frederick Dunn sent you and be sure to pay the same price as everybody else who does not mention me. But you could isolate your bees, isolate your queen, move her into a nuke, right? And put filler frames in the hive. So push all the remaining frames together and filler frames on the outside. And you can use uh, empty feeder frame feeders that's one thing that you know I'm working on right now is making blank frames that'll serve as temporary placeholders so that your bees don't start to draw new comb in these empty spaces because we're going to bring her back. So then, because this just occurred to me because Cayman and I were talking and I said, wow, you know, people get really upset because they see a lot of dead bees when they treat with Formic Pro. And oftentimes people do that in conjunction with replacing queens. So in other words, they order in a bunch of queens or they're they're making their own queens, they're banking them, they're finishing them, whatever they're doing, and they're getting ready to install them in different colonies. So they coincide that with a Formic Pro treatment because then if the queen is damaged, they're bringing in a new one anyway. But in my case, for the backyard beekeeper, not buying in new bees or new queens or anything like that, isolating the queen in her frames, 
separate. Do the Formic Pro treatment, two packs at one time, because that takes care of the uh, mites that are under the cappings too. So that's 10 days, right? So you give them that treatment and you just reduce the numbers, you reduce a little bit of the brood, you wiped out most of your Varroa destructor mice, except for those that went with your queen. Now, after that treatment's over with, your packs are out, you bring the queen back, you put her back in the center, take your blank frames out, because you're going to, of course, replace the queen with the two frames that she took with her, or the one frame that she took with her, however you decide to do it. And now you did population control, which reduces swarm control at a time when other colonies would be ramping up and, of course, swarming off. So you kept your bees. You knocked out your mites. Now, here's the other thing. You would say, well, you lost a lot of production on that during that period. However, in the absence of the Varroa destructor mite numbers, and remember, you're only doing this to a colony that has demonstrated they have a lot of Varroa destructor mites in them. How many are we talking about? Well, if you do a 300 mite count, mite wash on your bees, and you find that you've got 15 or 20 mites on that, I would hit them, right? So, and you've done this with an organic treatment. Formic Pro is considered an organic treatment for your bees. So if you're trying to get organic certification or whatever you do, or you want to be able to tell people you use no synthetic treatments and things like that, that qualifies. So you killed several birds with one stone again. You kept your population low. You wiped out your Varroa destructor mites. You kept your bees from swarming. And now you bring back the queen. Now she has access to all the rest of those brood frames. And off you go, uh, the happy backyard beekeeper, right? So that's one way to reduce the swarm impulse, right? Also at this time of year, when they're filling up these frames, one of the most important things that brand new beekeepers fail to do is have medium supers ready to go and getting them on the hive at a time when their populations are building because these populations expand rapidly, which means more foragers go out, the weather warms all of a sudden, and it is incredible how quickly they're bringing in nectar, how fast they're using up their open cells, which creates congestion, which removes brood space, which kicks off what? Swarming instincts and, of course, the production of swarm queen cells. So getting ahead of all of that with any number of these options, but expanding your hive to reduce some of that congestion and also give you the place to collect the honey that I hope you're thinking that you might want to get. So uh, those are my thoughts on that. Share your own thoughts down below. We also talked about the keeper's hive. That is one method for people that don't want to lift heavy boxes. Please Google the keeper's hive and uh, see how that method is used uh, to control also and reduce swarming in your hive. And uh, apparently it works really well. I haven't tried the hive yet. They are going to be at the uh, North American Honey Bee Expo. And you can talk to them and look at that stuff in person. So I hope you're going to be there for that. Let's move on to question number four. This comes from Essa from Elba, Minnesota. It says, thanks for the drawing lesson. Thanks for watching. I did a video where I drew a picture of a bee and talked about bees. I have three well-insulated hives, one lands, and two DD langs. So for DD, I think it means double deep langs. Approximately R20 tops, so that's pretty darn good. This is an R10. So R20 is twice that insulation value. And uh, R10 sides. So how do I know if my bees are getting enough water in the winter time? I have screened bottoms and slatted racks with a two inch by three eighths inch hive entrance, right? So that's very important. Two inches by three eighths of an inch. And this, uh, this winter, I'm, I'm focusing in on rodent studies, small mammal biology. I have to know things because we're doing more testing because somebody scared me a little bit. They wrote a comment last Friday that said that they were doing the 3 8 inch by so many inch entrance and they had a mouse get in and uh, did severe damage to their colony. I was very concerned about that because I've done all the testing I can think of to do to prove that even the smallest shrew doesn't get in through a 3 8 inch opening but then they took the comment away. So I don't know if the problem was mis-evaluated or what's going on, but I'm, I'm going revisiting that subject and I'm testing to see if the 3 8 inch opening still prevents shrews. And I'm talking about the pygmy shrew, the tiniest one. 
So we don't want those things in your hives. But anyway, the bees are getting enough water. One of the things you look at uh, when we get a warm up, like right now, instead of sitting here talking to you, I should be out looking at the bee yard because the bees would be flying out doing cleansing flights. They do that because their abdomens are full, because they're getting a lot of moisture, right? If they're not doing a lot of cleansing flights, that might be a cause for concern. Uh, the other thing is if there's a bunch of bees that are dead and piled up uh, and you know for sure that there's honey, food, and resources in there and they're piling up on the bottom of your hive, uh, you need to scrape them out. When you're scraping out and cleaning your entrances, and I highly recommend you do that. I didn't bring my scraper with me and my supervisor's not here. He carries one with him all the time. That would be the eight-year-old official junior beekeeper. Um, when you're scraping them out, look at their bodies. Look at their abdomens if they're extended or contracted. If they're tiny and contracted, it means that these bees don't have resources. They don't have water to metabolize resources and things like that. So the other thing you can do is you'll see bees on a warmer day, they'll be at the entrance and their little faces will be out. You can actually take a pipette and drink fresh or drip fresh water right in front of that entrance and see if they come out and start drinking it right away. The other thing you can do is there are some very inexpensive temperature and humidity sensors that you can put inside your hive. Um, I do that only on my observation hives because it's convenient. And uh, so we know the um, percentage of humidity, the relative humidity inside the hive. And you should see that in the 60s, right? Low 60s. So that's the other thing. And when we pull the top off, again, when my supervisor was here, we had a semi-warm day and he wanted to look at his bees to see if they were eating his fondant. So we put this five pound packet of fondant on there and in his hive they had eaten a perfect cookie cut all the way up to this plastic surface. Now when you're looking at that plastic surface you should you should see some tiny droplets of condensation on the interior surface of that plastic there. So that's one easy way to look at it. So if you've got a fondant pack or if you've got uh, dry sugar, uh, if you put your sugar in there in a rapid round your rapid round has a cover. Hopefully it's a clear cover. And if you see any condensation, normally it's directly in the center of your fondant lid. You'll see little driplets there that lets you know they have enough humidity. Uh, if that's completely dry, then you have a problem. But the next thing is, uh, what would you do to fix the problem? The only hive that I can think of or configuration that would cause the interior uh, air of your hive to be too dry in winter. They need water. Dr. Thomas Seeley did extensive studies on their demand for water in wintertime. This top venting and upper vent, upper entrances and things like that that are used in wintertime by some people is designed to remove away humidity, right? So if your bees do not have water, um, that open top vent would be one of the things that I would close up right away until that humidity level increases and the condensation restores because the bees absolutely need it inside the hive. So tilt your hive towards your landing board. When, uh, and it doesn't have to be much of a tilt, perfectly level hives or hives that are gradually tilted back. Um, if you have a solid bottom board, and your hive tilts back. In the winter time, that's a potential problem. The reason is that a lot of condensation will trickle down the interior surfaces of the side walls of your hive. And then now we have water pooling in the back of the hive where it has nowhere to go. If you have a screen bottom board like is described here, uh, there is a screen bottom board, which I'm a fan of, and that's where I'm headed in the long run trays underneath screens enclosed, right? So that's the other thing. I can pull those trays and see if there's moisture collecting in the bottom of them. And I can swap them out with clean trays at any time in the winter time and uh, just open up the back, pull out the bottom. So uh, when it drips down, if it collects in the back, that's bad news. So if you've got a solid bottom board, all of my hives are slightly tilted forward. And then we can see when we go out there, if they're moist on the front. So hives that have the front corners are a little damp and the edges are a little damp and maybe next to the entrance reducer, you see some dampness, plenty of moisture, they're good to go. 
So those are the indicators. Um, and like I said, if it's too dry, one of the first things I look for is uh, venting. Close it up because it's too dry. So the other thing is, um, if it's too dry, your bees cannot metabolize even honey. They need condensation. That's why I'm going to beat that horse is that uh, too much venting is going to reduce humidity and create a demand and a challenge potentially for some of your bees, depending on where you live. See what it just did? It's where you live that matters. Question number five. This is from Bob from o Omac, Wisconsin. I'm about to have a new well drilled and the site location is within 75 feet of my apiary. Will the vibrations, so I'm trying to visualize 75 feet. Mm -hmm. Will the vibrations from the drilling adversely affect my hives? I'm at 4,000 feet elevation, day temps are at or below freezing. So the bees are not active at this time. Should I close the entrances so they can't get out if disturbed? I would hate for the drilling crew to be swarmed with angry bees. Did, and it says I should mention, I have 12 colonies of various states of population. Moving them to another location temporarily is not an option. And so this is very important. And this ties in with a discussion that I recently had with some other people. Um, yes, close up the hives. Even though you think they're in there, I'm gonna show you some things really quick. This is the Cirocell entrance. Uh, this is a robbing screen. So, you know, your bees can go up through here, but they also work really well to just close up the hive and still have the ventilation on the front. They have screws to go through. So a Cirocell entrance uh, robbing screens. Most people have seen the Bee Smart Design robbing screen, same thing. This is the open position on the top. Keep them closed, but they provide airflow. Attach that to the front. I would not hesitate. I don't count on the weather to keep my bees in, by the way. Um, when it comes to workers being anywhere near your hive, 75 feet is still pretty close because look what we're doing. We're drilling a well. So drilling wells, you think of a drilling rig, right? Drilling something, but they drive that well casing in there. That thing is hammered in. So they are thumping the ground. So there are a lot of things that I want people to think about. And, uh, the cover image today was the, um, Guardian Bee Apparel Veil. So I wanted to do that to remind myself. This is their Guardian Bee Apparel Veil. And no, they did not sponsor this today and I get nothing for telling you about it. But this is a zippered veil. Here's the thing that I want you to understand. Uh, when people come on your property to do work, meter checkers, the mailman, the UPS driver, if they drive machinery that vibrates and you've got bees and you know your bees are nearby, I do. They are nearby. Um, it's your job to protect the public and the workers from your bees. So there are a couple of things. One is like years ago, I wanted to have a really nice professional electric fence around um, my apiary. I wanted a six foot tall fence with electric wires, every third wire, whatever, those guys would not come and put up that fence because they saw all the beehives. And I said, well, we'll put you all in bee suits and everything else, but they were so scared of them, they wouldn't do it. So I was on my own. That's why I have noisemakers now instead of a bear fence, right? And it's still working. Again, not telling you to do it, but I have no fence around my upper apiary. I do have a fence around the lower one, which deer jump over with ease can't stand them. Anyway, moving on. Um, let's say a worker comes on your property. You need to check in with your insurance company. Now that's a call that a lot of people don't want to make because your insurance company may tell you, well, we didn't know you had bees. And now that we know you do, we're going to charge you lots of money. Uh, if you are not insured, if you're not covered, and one of those guys just happens to be sensitive to bee stings and ends up in the hospital, you are about to pay fat stacks. Uh, your insurance company needs to know that you have bees and they need to know that uh, you took precautions because here's the next part of that. I actually looked into cases where people were charged, beekeepers were charged for keeping bees 
and uh, where someone was injured and they were successfully sued. That's key. Because uh, today, you know, people sue for everything. Uh, but also a discussion recently came up. Uh, there was a bee field day and it was one of the honey queens. So somebody that's actually part of this organization was stung. They didn't know that she was sensitive. She went to the hospital. And uh, of course, the organization that was running that program was insured, but she had a hospitalization stay. There was a kind of a scare centered around that. But after that event, their insurance is borderline unaffordable. So this leads me to like this situation right here. We're going to be thumping the ground. We need to find out some well drillers. It's just one guy. He's just a couple of people, whatever. I would outfit them with, uh, if it's the time of year when your bees are flying. So I'm not just applying this to you, the specific circumstance of it being freezing during the day and the chance that your bees flying is low, but uh, your risks are high. So I would definitely give that person, I'd first I'd find out, you know, are you allergic to bees? Do you even know? And uh, point out where the bees are. And if you get visited by bees, let me know right away, that kind of thing. But I wouldn't even go that far. I would put robbing screens on all of my bees for the time frame that they are thumping the ground and doing something that could get the bees' attention. So I want to talk to you about um, a lot of beekeepers have no problems about inviting a bunch of people onto their property to look at their bees because this is this is the bigger picture. Um, and then a lot of there's some kind of peer pressure that happens where people that have been keeping bees for a while don't want to you know put on any kind of protective clothing because somehow it makes them look less professional or something when they're around brand new beekeepers that are covered from head to toe. Um, but if this is your private property and uh, you're going to walk around somebody's bee yard or you're having somebody over to show them around your bee yard. It's your job to outfit them. In wintertime, people often get surprised because they think they're just going to go out there with their poly cap on. My supervisor, I have a problem with him. He runs around with no protection on. And uh, he uh, had a bee fly right up his sleeve one day and it got him pretty good. I thought that was pretty funny because I had just told him to put something on. But anyway, um, it's your job to make sure that people are protected, that they have protective clothing, and it's your job to know your bees. Here's the other part of that. Uh, people are more than ready to sue you. If you like to work with hot bees, genetically aggressive bees, you are accepting an enormous liability. It's your job as the beekeeper to protect the public. You have to think of the FedEx person that comes up your driveway, the UPS driver, those trucks are noisy. They'll sit there and check their phones while their engines are running. Um, if any of those people get stung, you're on the hook for that. So let's just look at this. Do you keep aggressive bees? So there was, uh, let's see, the bee club field day. We have a city. The city was sued because bees stung a passerby and guess where the bees were being kept? On a vacant lot within the city. Now we all know there's a lot of people that go, look, there's a vacant lot, let's start a garden club. And let's go ahead and put a beehive on there. And it all looks pretty benign. You know, not every gardener wants to be around honeybees, but it seems a natural thing. Let's put them in there and let's set up a cage around the bees. So they end up getting one of those dog kennels that's got, uh, you know, the chain link fence that goes around it and then they put a padlock on it so only certain people can get to it right but uh here's what happened uh the city has an ordinance against keeping bees in the city so when the city failed to take action to prevent these people from putting a beehive on this vacant lot with this garden club an allergic man uh was stung sued the city successfully got fat stacks so now the people that set up the beehive, they were let off the hook because what happened is neighbors had already said, hey, they're not allowed to keep bees over there. And then they came out and said, oh, it's just bees and they're pollinating. What do you have against bees? Bees are everywhere anyway, blah, blah, blah. But when you put them in a box and you manage them and they're your bees, that becomes your responsibility. Well, the city failed to enforce their own ordinances, so they got sued successfully. And this one in California, an allergic man sued a neighbor. 
And then another one sued a neighbor in Hawaii. This is the funniest one that I came across. You can probably Google it and find it pretty easy. Guess what? Uh, the man that sued the trucker that was trucking migratory bees. So we've got 400 and some hives in the back of a truck. We know that they go to pollination contracted services. They're going all over the place. And we always see it on the news. Everybody, if you're on social media and a truck turns over on a highway anywhere, everybody sends you the pictures. Look at that. Look at that. Thousands of bees, hundreds of thousands of bees. Well, it's really interesting here. The man that sued them was part of the response team. So he's in a bee suit. And I guess didn't know how allergic he was, but uh, part of the response team and he sued the trucking company because while they're cleaning up all these bees from the highway, uh, they noticed that the way the bees were secured on the rig was not adequate. So you see, they look for these little openings to sue people, but you're on the rapid response team specifically for bees. My bee club has these people too. And so you go there, but then you get stung a bunch, and now you're going to sue the trucking company because you saw an opening. Hey, they didn't legally secure those bees the way they're supposed to, to drive them across this interstate, right? So the thing I want to remind everyone of is if you get a visitor to your bee yard, you're on the hook for how your bees are. If you are keeping Africanized bees because you think that those bees just do better at everything and they don't require varroa mite treatment and all that stuff. Ignoring the fact that one of the reasons they don't need varroa treatment is because they constantly swarm. They usurp other colonies of bees so that you're not a good beekeeping neighbor if you do that too because your Africanized bees are likely to take over, do hostile takeovers of some of the European honeybees, for example. And, uh, but if somebody gets stung by those and you knew that you had Africanized bees and that you're intentionally maintaining them, you're going to be 100% liable if something bad happens. So that leads me to my shout out for today, because I want you to appreciate this. There are new beekeepers out there, right? Um, who need to really think about what you're about to do you are going to put venomous insects in a box. You're going to put them on your property. You need to know the genetics and disposition and how to assess your bees, and you are the front line. So if you get a mentor who says something like, beekeepers that wear bee suits don't know anything about bees. I've be kept without a stitch of clothing for the last 30 years of my life and I'm 85 years old and I do it now and I have no tan lines, you know, whatever their excuse is. You should have a bee suit, fully protective gear, head to toe, boots, gloves, veil, suit. I don't care if you never wear it. It needs to be in your garden shed. It needs to be available to you because if your bees get out of control and become overly aggressive or defensive, it's up to you to take action on those bees. You are the beekeeper. Your job is to protect people from your bees. We're thinking of protecting our bees from everything else. But the reality is they're a venomous insect. People do have allergies. And you could find yourself facing heavy duty medical bills, right? I'm just saying it. This is one of the reasons I can't teach classes on my property. Um, I can bring in tiny groups to visit and look at my bees. And we have bee suits for everybody. I don't care who you are. You have a bee suit available if you come and walk on this property. And uh, the thing is, if I were teaching classes here, my insurance is astronomical. I could not successfully teach beekeeping and uh, not have it cost me money to do it. So I can't do that. So I can only get visitors and I can teach on YouTube. So, and I have my, my very first uh, Way to Be Academy graduate coming up this spring, the eight-year-old who just got his shirt yesterday. So, that's what we do. That's what I want you to do is be very careful and understand what you're getting into. And my shout out today is for a channel called, now I understand this is one of those big sensational channels. It's called Real Wild. In the title of the video that I want you to look for, and the link will be down in the video description, 
the dangerous bees that have killed over a thousand people. Slant, real wild. Now, when you watch that, sometimes the narrations on a lot of these things, you know, they'll say the bee, he puts his stinger in, you know. So, okay, these are female bees. But Africanized bees, I want you to watch it all the way through. I want you to think about personally what you would do if you had bees like this. Uh, because they are incredibly defensive. One of the things that was a little frustrating, I watched the whole thing, the guy repeatedly gets stung on his nose. So in other words, his veil comes up against his nose while he's in the presence of Africanized bees. They're after him. I mean, I'm trying to be polite, but if you're frequently getting stung on your nose, could you not put a clear piece of cellophane right there? Or could you not put a piece of duct tape, just a little square piece right in front of your nose where you're constantly being stung? Or is it important to show viewers that you know we have to show some violence so we can get views? I don't know what's going on. But I would be protecting my nose. Maybe put a piece of duct tape right on the end of your nose. Most people put a ball cap on, a big brimmed hat. It holds the veil out in a way. Guardian Be Apparel has uh, one of my favorite veils too. They've got the, it's kind of a Buckfast Abbey style veil, right? These are considered fencing veils and uh, Guardian Bee Apparel was the first to come up with the first because they're everywhere. So I want to make that distinction. They came up with this uh, zippered front so you could drink. And if you don't want to, of course you wouldn't do this when you're dealing with all the bees, but you could also just unzip the side here, stick a straw through and drink to stay hydrated and ready to go while you're dealing with the bees. But they also make um, veils that have, not Guardian, but other companies do, where this part is vented, but this part is plastic. So you can see through it, but of course nothing's gonna sting you and it's better for spotting eggs, right? So the whole key uh, behind keeping bees from stinging you is to have fabric between your skin and the bees and uh, you want enough space. And so Guardian Bee Apparel, the vented bee suits, they create enough space so the stinger doesn't get to your body. Uh, and of course you can, you can layer your clothing. So in other words, if you're looking for that gift for the beekeeper in your life, a Guardian Bee Apparel uh, suit just might be 10% off for the next three days. So if you're watching this down the road, that doesn't help you. But Guardian Bee Apparel, because I got the email today, uh, has 10% off their hives. Now, I don't get anything for that. It's not an affiliate link or anything else. It's Guardian Bee Apparel. I'm just celebrating an American company that designed bee suits, gloves, and everything else. And uh, they were the first ones that came up with that zipper thing, which is copied by so many different companies now. They're the first and they make the best bee suits. And here's why. If you uh, are working on a really hot day, a vented bee suit is the only suit you should get. And if it's a colder day, guess what? You layer up. You just put on thicker sweatshirts and things like that under it. Are you going to war? Is there a bald-faced hornet nest out there that you have to go and deal with? Then you layer up and you keep that thing away from your face and you put the duct tape on your nose and you do whatever you need to do to keep from being stung because you're about to go into it and you don't want to be running away. You're going to go in there with your Dawn Ultra Free and Clear dish soap, two tablespoons per gallon. You're going to pump it up in your garden sprayer and you're gonna to have to deal with whatever the threat is because you are the front line. So with that, what else is there to say? Not much, Friday, December the 8th. I'm really glad that you were here with me today. I hope that you got something beneficial out of it. And uh, I hope you have a really great weekend and stay safe and take charge of the bees under your control. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.